Ehm. Um. <clears throat> Today I decided I would play Pikmin for old time's sake. This is one of my favorite games growing up. It's a strategy game, but it's for the GameCube. A little counterintuitive. You've probably heard of Pikmin. But if you haven't, it's a game about commanding a little army of people called Pikmin who have plants growing on their heads. You play as Olimar, an astronaut from an alien world who's crash landed on the Pikmin's planet. The Pikmin help you in a series of challenges to gather up the parts to your rocket ship and escape home. I always loved this game because it helped me engage in some long-term planning as a kid. You have 30 days to gather the 30 ship parts before your life support runs out. But if you're really good at planning, you might be able to get it done faster than that. So if I managed to finish it in under 30 days, I always felt super smart. Anyway, I wanted to go back and see if my adult brain could do it any faster because my old record was only about 24 days and I'd killed like 1100 Pikmin in that time. But you know, on a more philosophical note, I think Pikmin cultivated in me a healthy awareness of death and that my time mattered as a kid. The time we have here on Earth is limited, and we need to plan out the right steps if we want to accomplish anything impactful or constructive by the time we're gone. Day 1. After crash landing from outer space, I started at the impact site. My ship, the Dolphin, missing its 30 essential parts, scattered around the world. Almost immediately, I discovered the Red Onion, shelter to the first Red Pikmin. It's basic math. One Pikmin carries one pellet. It wasn't long before one Pikmin became two, two became five, and before you know it, we're on to feats of strength like pushing a paper bag out of the way. We found the ship's engine and returned it to the dolphin with a might of twenty. Night fell on the first day, and the seed of hope was planted. Day two. We landed on the planet again, but this time in the forest of hope. I summoned the Pikmin from the womb-like shelter of the onion and sent them out for a nice, thick pellet of ten. There's nothing like having a lot of people following you around and doing what you tell them to. We retrieved the first ship part, the Eternal Fuel Dynamo, just sitting there by the spotty bulb orbs. Once I felt like I had enough Pikmin that I could sacrifice, I, I mean, accidentally lose a few of them, we dispatched the spotty bulb orbs from behind. Naturally, the next Pikmin we met were the Yellow Pikmin, uniquely capable of utilizing the destructive capability of bombs in order to clear obstacles and maim our enemies. Sometimes with ironic, self-destructive results. The next day, it's onto the Extraordinary Bolt. Just what makes it so extraordinary is a secret. But just look at it. Extraordinary. Then it's the Whimsical Radar and the Nova Blaster. On day four, we encounter a trio of burrowing snaggrits, one of whom coughs up the Geiger counter. At the end of the day, we do a lot of procrastinating to propagate more Pikmin. Because, um... We lost almost all the Pikmin today. By day five, we finally unlocked the forest navel, aka the belly button of the forest. The second area and home to the third and final onion, dwelling of the amphibious blue Pikmin, who have mouths and are able to breathe underwater. We also learn about the red Pikmin's ability. They're fireproof. The other Pikmin aren't. Fortunately, this lets us kill the fiery blowhogs that inhabit the shore of the forest navel. Killing the wallywogs that descend from above is a different matter, and a much more challenging task, costing many, many Pikmin lives. By day seven, we managed to locate the gravity jumper, only before accidentally drowning the red and yellow Pikmin. On day eight, we pursued the bread bug and killed him. Despite the fact that he displayed almost no aggression toward us, he had swallowed the space float, which is basically a life preserver. We spent the rest of the day bombing entrances to prepare for day nine, on which I focused exclusively on reproducing blue Pikmin to carry back the extremely heavy antidioxin filter from the water where the Wallywogs had hopped their last. We desperately tried to reproduce the lost Pikmin at the end of the day. By day 10, we had paved the way for the Libra and the analog computer, only before setting, I, I mean accidentally setting all the blue and yellow Pikmin on fire. Hope remained. 20 days left and only 16 ship parts to go. On day 11, we fought the strangest of enemies, the puff stool an enigmatic fungus that turned the Pikmin on me. Mostly innocuous, though. He had swallowed the Omega Stabilizer. The day concluded with more procrastination in cultivating replacement Pikmin to fill out our army. On day 12, we fought the Beady Longlegs, which is sort of like a piñata and a spider at the same time, dropping out the essential guard satellite for our ship. 
The blue Pikmin took a bath with the number one Ionium jet, and then we flew back to the Forest of Hope for day 13 to fight the armored cannon beetle, guardian of the radiation canopy. His remains a true sight to behold, and a much needed fertilizer for the few remaining yellow Pikmin. This all allowed us to expand the radius of the ship and make our way to the distant spring on day 14. The last main area where we encountered the more aggressive Spotty Bull Bear, frequently confused with the Spotty Bull Borb. Despite similar appearances, they are in fact not related. Next, it was the repair type. Oh god. A repair type bull. We killed a Spotty Bull Bear to retrieve the massage table, but admittedly at this point, the ship parts seemed a bit less essential and more just, like, conveniences. I mean, massage table? We made the mistake of aggravating the Smoky Prague, which resembles a disturbed river spirit, and lost, um, almost all of the red Pikmin. Despite this, we survived the attack until nightfall when we returned to the sky once again for a well-deserved rest. On day 15, it's back down to the planet to retrieve the last 10 parts, starting with a very heavy and expensive gluon drive. No one really knows what the gluon drive does, but it is, after all, very expensive guarded by more deadly yellow wallywogs. Day 16, it's the interstellar radio, and the procession of dwarf bull bears to replace our fallen comrades. And on day 17, it's my favorite obstacle in the entire game, this weird maze which is intractably difficult to navigate using the controls, but admittedly is sort of fun, and feels like the childhood game of navigating a metal ball through a maze. All that to get to the UV lamp, which actually turns out to be a non-essential part to the ship. The afternoon concludes with yeeting another armored cannon beetle to retrieve the bowsprit, which also has a very vague and dubious function. We are now sitting at 24 parts, with only 5 left to go in the area. The zirconium rotor, also very expensive. The pilot's seat, honestly a, an optional item. The Kronos, uh, Kronos reactor. And the number 2 ionium jet. By day 20, it's time to return back to the impact site to fight Mamuda which is basically some sort of stuffed sock golem, and retrieve the positron generator by throwing people into the mouths of the pearly clam clamps. After that, it's time to cash out with these thick, juicy pellets to raise an army of Pikmin rivaling Mordor. Night falls, and so, after much holding of breath, it's finally time to embark upon the final trial. In total, 414 Pikmin remaining under my command. The last road to the final boss is elemental in its challenges, and features this sort of disharmonic yet also sing-songy childish music in the background. It doesn't take that long to complete these challenges, but the final boss lies there, dormant and menacing, evocative of the Sarlacc Pit on Tatooine. It's pretty obvious what we're supposed to do here, I don't want to act like it's a tough boss fight. Sacrifice one unfortunate Pikmin to awaken him, Emperor Bullblax owner of the largest mouth in all of Pikmin. You know, there's probably a better way to fight this final battle by using the bombs on the sidelines, but w whenever I try that, my Pikmin just stand there and look at him before he consumes them. His face is the weak point, but this guy's also got hops. Unfortunately, this time in the middle of the fight, my Wii remote ran out of battery, and um, I actually died. I'd never, I'd never lost this battle before. Nonetheless, I, you know, I still stand by it. We Pikmin is the superior Pikmin, except it unfortunately requires juicy batteries. After my untimely loss of consciousness, I returned the next day to thwart Bullblacks by throwing over 200 Pikmin at him. All this to cough up the secret safe, creating a, a major ethical dilemma due to the fact that I had sacrificed hundreds of lives for a few quarters. No matter! With the final part inside, we now had 30 out of 30 parts. All it had cost were 1,331 Pikmin, with only 40 surviving. But you know what? I did it in 22 days, so that's gotta be worth, um... 282 lives, yep. Yeah, I don't think too hard about it. Anyway, that's two days faster, and that's what matters. Right? <laughs> right? <laughs> Pikmin is still Nintendo's great homage to existentialism. You know, all the kid themes aside, I think it's a metaphor. Pikmin is about war and death and making the most of your life, and it engages me intellectually, unlike that Italian plumber. It's a personally authentic Nintendo experience that I love to return to. Well, you just watched a video about a game that's now over 20 years old. 
A big thanks to my patrons, all of whom I will rejoin on Planet Hockitate when I return from this exodus. I'm Ambiguous Amphibian. Until next time, my friends.